Ooh, Ooh, nice. nice. I did that. They sent me. They said they sent me this with a with a JD nine on it. Nice. Jermaine has very very kindly agreed to donate uh, a pair of boots to a lucky winner. Now the grounds for this is that this video needs to get a thousand likes on YouTube. These are the new X's, Adidas. Subscribe, like the video, leave a comment, and we're gonna be picking someone at random who is gonna get some signed memorabilia from Jermaine Defoe. You know, I went to the hospital, I saw him, and I remember one of the first pictures that I think everyone saw at the hospital was like me sort of like in the bed with him. And literally I was sitting on the side and he was like, no, 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 can you get in the bed? He put the cover over me, like he just wanted the cuddle. It was unbelievable. When you play at you have to win and you have to win in style. That's the pressure. And that's the sort of pressure that I wanted at the back end of my career. And the second spell for me, so it's that 2010 season, that was the best football I've ever played. As soon as Daniel says to me about the money, I thought, I'm going. <laughs> 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 when he just said that, that and to be fair, he said, you know what, JD? He said, like, you've been unbelievable here. But well, I always wanted to play for England, so I didn't want to be one, I didn't want to turn around and be like, you know what, I'm just going to re retire in the national football because at the end of the day, it's one of those ones. Managers come and go. But when I look at the lack of black managers and coaches, I'm not just talking about black managers and black coaches. I'm talking about black people in general in football, in a football environment. Of course, you, you think, wow, like, at some point, something has to change. Hello listeners and welcome back to yet again another episode of the Beautiful Game podcast. As ever, I'm your host Budge, joined by my faithful two co-conspirators Dot and Dej. Jen, how are we this fine evening? I'm good man, I can't stop smiling man. Big up to me. <laughs> Take good time out to come to the team. 100% man, how about you Dej? I'm cool bro. This one, ah, oh, I've been waiting, waiting, waiting. <laughs> yeah, man. It's the bags, man. So, yeah, let's get <laughs> started. Of course, of course, we're going to get it cracking, but we've got to give this man his accolades because we're about top strikers, top marksmen, and like you said, they uh, bagsmen. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you don't need to look any further than this than this gentleman that we were joined on the podcast with this in. In uh, in April of 2011, he became the 20th player to score 100 Premier League goals. He's currently the eighth highest goal scorer in Premier League history, as well as the uh, sixth highest goal scorer in Tottenham's history. He, um, throughout his career, has been both a certified starter and a super sub at the same time. He uh, holds their Premier League record for the most uh, goals scored as a, a substitute. He's been capped 57 times by England and scored uh, uh, twice. You know, when, when, when children are, are born and they're, they're taking their first steps, you know, some, 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 ch some children's first word is, is daddy. <laughs> his word is mummy. <laughs> but his first word was net. <laughs> That's all he's known. <laughs> from, 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 from an infant until now, all he's known is the net, the right? Net. And so with, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Jermaine Defoe to the platform. Welcome. Oh, welcome, 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 welcome. MBE as well, well boys. Don't forget oh, that. Yeah. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. Don't forget forgive me, forgive me. <laughs> OBE. Forgive me, forgive me. Look, Jermaine, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on, man. The moment that we, we, we um, put it out, out on that yeah. you were uh, you were gonna come on that little uh, promo video. It started doing the rounds, man. Um, actually, wow. we were we were inundated with questions, so I want to put it out there already now. Early doors, we could basically do this whole interview just with listeners' questions. Wow. Uh, fortunately, we're not going to be able to answer or, or or ask Jermaine every single one of the questions. So I just want to apologize in advance. Um, but we're going to try and get through as many of the listener questions as possible. Before we get into it also, I need to remind all of you, if you're not yet subscribed to our YouTube, it's the Beautiful Game podcast, and you can also listen to all of our audio interviews on Spotify. So, let's, let's begin. Yeah, <laughs> no worries, Jermaine. Put this charger in, so they say, yeah, let's go. Yeah, so obviously, to kick things off, um, little Bradley Lowry, who was three years yesterday, and um, I saw you yeah. tweet. Yeah. <sighs> Why did you bond with him so much and why was that connection so important for you? Do you know what it was? The way it started was, so basically when I was at Sunderland, mm. it was just like a mascot. So it was, just like a, it was just like a normal thing. It was a mascot. The girl Louise, who was like the press officer at the time, she basically come up to me and said, oh, this young kid, like he loves you. Um, she explained what the problem was, but like he obviously wasn't well and stuff like that. And she just basically said, do you mind uh, just walking him out onto the pitch and stuff like that? You're his favorite player. I said, yeah, no problem. 
And then like, I literally, I was in the changing before the game and I can hear this little kid running around the changing room. And I thought like, I can't be Bradley because the way that she described him, like um, I thought he was sort of like, would have been really quiet and like, sort of like, you know what kids are like sometimes, they're going out, they're shy and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> literally, he just ran over to me, he jumped on my lap and he just started talking and that. I was like, wow, just energy energy and stuff like that. And then after that, you know, I spoke to Louise and I said, what's actually going on? And I, I want to speak to the parents and stuff like that. I spoke to the parents and, you know, I went to the hospital, I saw him. And I remember one of the first pictures that I think everyone saw at the hospital was like me sort of like in the bed with him. And literally I was sitting on the side and he was like, no, 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 can you get in the bed? He put the cover over me. Like he just wanted a cuddle. It was unbelievable. And then after that, literally, I just spent so much time with him. Um, and obviously towards the end, it was, it was difficult because it's sort of like the cancer that he had, it was, it was obviously palliative care. There was nothing they can do, just keep for as long as possible. And when you've got a child of five, six, you know, suffering like that, it's, it's, it's hard to sort of be around it. But at the same time, you have to try and be positive and try and put a smile on his face. And that's what I try to do. Yeah, I mean, that was a relationship that gripped the nation, you know, because most people see footballers as unaccessible, you know, and you just connected straight away. And I think everyone sort of, you know, grew a newfound respect for you. You know, they thought, you know what, this is a man that's going above and beyond the call of duty, you know, to provide care for someone in need. And it's your compassionate, humane and empathy. Yeah, exactly, because it's one of those ones where people, like you said, a lot of times with footballers um, get stereotypes. People just see the negative um, and not actually understanding that at the end of the day, like, a lot of us come from working class backgrounds. Do you know what I mean? Like, and with the Bradley thing, it was one of those ones where when I was going to the hospital, seeing him or going to the house, like his mum would just post it on, in, in, uh, on Facebook and it would just go right, it would just go crazy. And then it would end up in the papers and stuff like that. And people want to talk to me. And I thought, you know what? I'm not doing it for this reason. Like I just got, even if I go to the house for like an hour, just to try and put a smile on his face and stuff like that. That's all I wanted to do really. And, and I know I've I got a lot from that as well, how it made me feel. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I've, just, I've, I've got amazing memories, amazing memories, you know, of, of, of Bradley. You know what, Jermaine, you, you mentioned uh, in, in, in terms of your relationship with Bradley that part of the reason why you, you developed such a strong bond with him was because of the fact that like, he, he changed you as a person in terms of what he was going through at such a young age. Yeah. And what I wanted to ask is the fact that your, your foundation works to help disadvantaged people yeah. you start before you met Bradley, right? So this is something that you've been very much involved in and something that's been dear to your heart for a long time. Yeah. So what was it prior to you meeting Bradley, which of course, like you mentioned, was a life-changing experience. But yeah. what was it prior to that that made you want to set up the charity and, and, and help those, those, those disadvantaged children? So basically how it started was, so it was, it was in 2010. It was after the World Cup when I came back. I remember there was, there was a hurricane in St. Lucia because remember when I, le when I launched it, it was probably mainly in St. Lucia because obviously there was a hurricane mm. and in St. Lucia there was only one recognised children's home which was tiny and I remember going there because we used to I used to support the children's home me and my family so what I used to do is every Christmas we would send you know the big barrels them big blue barrels and that so we would send the things that they needed like that you can't get over there do you know what I mean like I don't know paracetamols like nappies mm. stuff like that sweets whatever the kids needed Christmas we used to send it in barrels so we was always supporting the children's home anyway then obviously when they had the hurricane uh, loads of the schools got destroyed the 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 the, the home so what we decided to do is launch the foundation and try and do some gala dinners and try and raise funds to try and build another children's home a bigger children's home for obviously the the abused and disadvantaged kids on the island and then we just expanded really. And then obviously we brought that over here, helping the sick cancer patients and, and stuff like that, the, the kids and stuff like that. And, it's, and to, be, to be honest, it's been, it's, it's been amazing. We've, we've managed to build a children's home in St. Lucia. Um, you've got to go there and see it. Amazing island. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's been good. So this was, when I did all this, this was 2000, well before I, I ever met Bradley, to be honest. Mm. So um, in January, you signed a pre-contract agreement to join Rangers um, permanently. Um, you're now piling your trade in the SPL, um, working under a living legend, Steven Gerrard, um, and his support team, Gary Macca and Mick Bill. How is that dynamic? Do you know what? It's good, you know. At first, it was a little bit like, obviously, you can imagine the band, isn't it? It's like, oh, J these best that play together and that sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Stevie's just like, I mean, 
he was the same as a player. I remember as in England captain, it wasn't one of those ones. It wasn't one of those players who would like scream and shout in the dressing room. Because you know, sometimes you get, you get a lot of players that would do that. And then you go out on a pitch, you don't see them. Do you mm. know what I mean? So he, he, wasn't, he, wasn't one of those ones, he wasn't one of those ones who'd be screaming and shouting. He'd be like cool and just composed. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, like at times you probably think, he looks serious and that, like, it's that long with him, but he's just cool, composed. If there's something needs to be said, he will say it. He's not afraid to say it. He will say it. He will let people know. Like, he will let people know. And that. But come match day, mate, he's, he's, he's ready. And he was the same as a player. Calm in the change rooms, he, he'd get out on the pitch and he's an animal. Same as, same as a manager. Steve is chilled. Do you know what I mean? He, he doesn't, he, he's one of those managers as well. Obviously, because he's still a young manager. Like, um, he doesn't, with me, it doesn't complicate anything. Do you know what I mean? JD, manage yourself. You know what you need, but just make sure you're ready for Saturday. And every time he wants me to play, like he managed me in the right way. So every time I play, he can get the best version of Jermaine Defoe. So I'm fresh, I'm ready to go. So it's good, man. Jermaine, what did he say when, when Liverpool won the league? Was he going mad? He said, JD, he said, he said he was, uh, he said he was up at 6.30. <laughs> he was getting up for work and that, and his friends were literally getting in. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Friends were crazy dead. celebrations. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, 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 of it's course, a special time for the football club and that. But he just said it was meant like his fam, family, his friends. It just went mad. His phone was going crazy, like you can imagine. Yeah, we're Liverpool fans, and I can tell you that me and Dot were waiting until seven in the morning as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Jermaine, moving on to the um, season, it's been like a season of two halves. I would say up until January. I would say you were doing very, very well. The winter break started when you obviously beat Celtic at Celtic yeah. Park. And obviously we spoke to Mick Bill on the platform. Then post-January, it sort of took like a downturn. There yeah. was a few strange results, obviously losing away at Hearts. Yeah. And I remember Steven Gerrard coming out after that game at Hearts and he was sort of questioning whether he was the correct man to lead this team forward. Yeah. How did Steven Gerrard sort of manage that situation? And you as players, how did you feel? Did you feel we need to rise to the occasion? Or were you thinking, hmm, what's going on here? No, do you know what it is? I think, I think naturally, you know, like sometimes as a player, and it must be the same as a manager, when you've had a bad game, you start to question things. Remember, you get all different characters. You start to question, you know what? Because you know if you've, if, 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 if you've had a, game, a good game or not, you start to question things. And I think it must be the same as a manager. Because remember, the game finishes and then bang, you're straight into the press emotions are high like you're pissed off so he probably thought you know what that, that's how he felt at that moment and that's that's an honest man do you know what i'm saying so but after that when he came in the next day everything's back to normal let's go again because remember we're talking about someone that's he's a fighter because mm. when you look, i don't know if anyone watched his documentary that the pressure that was on that man for all those years people don't realize and uh, and to fight all the way through it and to achieve what he achieved, I think, you know, that's, 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 that's a fight. And, and that's, that's what we did. And as, as play, we just thought, you know what? We had a few bad results. Because like you said, the first part of the season, like, personally, I'm thinking, no one's stopping us. If we're playing like this, putting these performances, and not just the, the, the 11, the squad. Like, do you know what I mean? Everyone that even came into the team. It was like, there was times when I weren't playing, but I thought, you know what? I know the team's going to win. Like, do you know what I mean? So it was one of those ones where everyone was confident. And I thought, you know what? No one's going to stop us. And then obviously we had the winter break and that. And I think it's a mixture of things. We came back from the winter break, a few players out of form, like, which is normal in football. Um, you get ups and downs, uh, a few injuries. I remember I got my injury out. I missed out for six weeks, you know. Um, and then you get like your key players who was sort of, so a little bit low on confidence and stuff like that. Um, so it was, it was, it was, it was difficult, but we still stuck to, we still stuck together. We still stuck together and thought, right, we just keep going, we keep going and then, and then, and then see what happens in that. Because when you look, when I sit there and I look at the, the players, sometimes I sit there and I look at the squad that we've got, there's some unbelievable talent in that dressing room. Like literally there's some unbelievable talent in that dressing room and that we just need to believe that we can do it this year and then, and, 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 and then see what happens and learn from our mistakes. Yeah, you mentioned players going out of form and I'm going to mention one, El Buffalo, you know, Morelos. Yeah. Like, he's a player I'm fascinated by. Like, I always watch the games and think, this is a player. Like, he can go to the very, very top. And yeah. you're the elder statesman in that dressing room. Yeah. How have you been, like, managing him? Because it seems like sometimes mentally he might not be switched off. Are you in a position where sort of like you manage him and say, come on, Alfredo, like if you want to get to that level, if you want to play in the top teams in Europe or the Prem, you've got to do this. 
you got to do it this way. You can't be, you know, letting your mentality let you down. Yeah, because like you said, the higher up you go, the more difficult. Like in terms of like the football side of it, the higher up you go, you have to be switched on in the game. You can't get frustrated in that because, I mean, we, we talk about the, the, the Premier League and international football. Sometimes in games and that, you, you, you might only get one decent chance in a game and you've got to take it. You have to be ruthless and stuff like that. So, um, but you know what? It's difficult. It's, it's, it's difficult for him at times. I feel sorry for him because remember, this is a kid that's come from Colombia. Sometimes at home on his own. His English isn't the best. Um, and he probably misses his family. Um, and I suppose, the, I suppose the only time he can sort of like sit on a football pitch, but then he gets frustrated. You know what I mean? He gets frustrated and stuff like that. But it's, I think it's a... It's deeper than just him going on a pitch and wanting to fight everyone. It's deeper than that. It's, it's, sometimes it's difficult for him because he's, just, he's, he's on his own. Do you know what I mean? It's hard. So what? Do you advise him? Do you speak to him and say, listen, like, I've, yeah. I've obviously played at the top level, you know, for Tottenham Champions League. Yeah. If you want to do this, you've got to cut this out of your game. You've got to eradicate it if you want to get to that level. We'll try and help him, to be honest. We'll, meeting. we'll try and help him, try and talk to him. And, um, and I think what, what I try and do as well, just... just be an example because sometimes I, I feel like when you're when, when if you're cool, like sometimes that's better than even talking to someone so he can he can see so when I remember when I first mm. come to the club and um I think he got suspended and he missed six games we won all six games right so I think he sat there and probably thought you know what I can't be missing games you know because if I'm missing games and the team are winning I'm not going to get back in the team so that so he came back last season and I saw a little change in him his game improved. The first part of the season, he was scoring goals consistently in Europe. He was on fire. A lot of people were talking about him. I thought, you know what? He's not getting involved in the, the other side of things. I thought, you know what? That's, that's cool. I can see him. So, in that sense, well, I, think, I, I, think, I think he has changed. Since I've been there, he's, he, he's changed a lot because before, he was just sort of like, he would just lose his head. He would just lose his head too quick and that. And I'd say, Buff, just stay calm. Just focus on goals. You know what I mean? So... How good do you think he can he can he can be, Jermaine? Like, what kind of level you think he could he could potentially reach if he's is dedicated and committed? Yeah, it's, up, it's to be fair, it's up to him really. Do you know what I mean, it's it's up to him because, like you said, and that like he scores a lot of goals up here. He scores a lot of goals um, consistently. Um, he gets himself in good areas, and he's hungry to score goals. He's got an appetite, which I like. And I think I think you have to. Sort of like because the thing that probably goes against him is his reputation. Mm. You know, like you would like to think that people would take a chance for him. Is the reputation and that because at the end of the day, you don't want to sort of like get a player in that's sort of like a hothead and, and he's getting set off for missing games when you invest in so much money into this. Do you know what I mean? So, but I think it's I think it's up to him if he can just sort of like get his head down this season, kick on again, um, not get involved and let people see that you've changed um, because the football side of it's fine. Uh, it's just the other side. Yeah, there was a recent, you know, kit promotion and he was missing, he was absent. So obviously a lot of Rangers fans are speculating, thinking, you know what, he might be off, you know, yeah. in the transfer window. From being in and around that situation, do you think he's going to still be at the club when the transfer window? You know what, it's mad, you know, because you see as players, it's one of those ones where as players, you never know what's going on with players. Because a lot of times, I've been there myself, where I know something's going on in the background and I've got a chance of leaving. But then, but then you can't really say anything to anyone. Do you know what I mean? Until it's actually done, even your closest friends at the train at training, you might say it to one person, but even people in and around the training band, you can't, you, you don't want it to get out and that. So you, as players, you don't really get involved in all that. And and to be honest, I don't think obviously you'd have a little bit of banter and stuff like that. You see <laughs> speculation, it'd be like, what? I was like, like <laughs> Uh, Glenn Kamara, I saw the Arsenal thing. I said, what, you going back to Arsenal, Glenn? <laughs> 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 but I'm not going to be like, oh, what's going on? Has your agent spoke to them, blah, blah, blah. It's not my place to do that, do you know what I mean? Of course. If, of course. I always feel that if you, if, you got, if you want to tell me something, you'll come to me and tell me. So, mm. so hopefully, so we don't, we don't even, we don't really know what's, what's going on. I remember football as well. Sometimes, as a player, you might think you're staying somewhere. All of a sudden, it's a phone call. Bang. You go in the next day, oh, we've accepted a bit. It happens so quick in football. Mm. It's crazy. Mental. Do you know what, Jermaine, I'll back to one of the points that you, made, you, uh, you raised earlier when you were talking about um, your relationship with, uh, with, with Stevie G and, and, you know, how he manages you and whatnot. Mm. Um, and I, re I remember reading uh, an article uh, a little while back when you were talking about um, prolonging your career. Of course, you're, you're like a, a Peter Pan. <laughs> <laughs> the guy doesn't age. Um, but you, but you, you spoke about... Um, 
uh, changing your diet and, and going vegan. And I can imagine how, I mean, that must have been difficult, of course, coming from an Afro-Caribbean heritage, you know. How, how Dirt, chicken, mac and cheese. Is, is, <laughs> is, uh, is, is in a diet and whatnot. Um, but aside from that, what other things have you had to do in terms of adaptation to prolong your career? Like, have you, have you had to tailor your training approach and, and work on different things, even in-game, um, to, 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 to help prolong your career? Do you know what it is? You see, like, when people think, People look at it. The people that are closest to me have played with me. They, they will tell you what I'm like and that. But you know, like people probably think, ah, oh, so he's got to a certain age and he's probably doing something different. You know what it is? You see what? The, the reason why I'm still playing now is because the things I was doing 10 years ago. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So it's not like when mm -hmm. I say to young players now, you don't get to a certain age and be like, oh, you know what? Like a light switch. Okay, let me just switch this on now. Let me just try and do this and, and do this and do this. I was doing stuff from years ago, from my Tottenham days in, in the gym. Like doing stuff, you know, doing things that you probably don't even like doing, but doing it like you love it. Remember my mm. I was doing things that players didn't want to do. When I see certain men finishing training and they're in their cars going home, I'm still there in the gym. I'm still, out, I'm still <laughs> outside doing my finishing. Yeah. I'm injury prevention, power work to, to be explosive so my muscles are strong. I'm doing this early 20s. I was doing this. And then I had a fitness guy, a fitness coach called Tibbers. It was, he used to be in the South of France. And, um, it's the hardest training I've ever done in my life. I used to go and see Tibbers for like, I say 10 days every summer before pre-season. And then uh, one day he said to me, he said, I'm going to put another, he said, I'll put, work with me, trust me. He said, I'll put another five, six years on your career. Mm. I was thinking, wow. I said, it don't feel like this. This work I'm doing, it don't feel like it. Feel like I'm <laughs> 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 I trusted him. Do you know what I'm saying? Cause I, cause, so I just thought, you know what? I'm going to trust you in that because when I used to work with him, when I used to go pre-season, like from the first day, I was ready to go. I was ready. I felt mm. strong. And all the things that he taught me, I still remember to this day. And um, so I was doing things years ago, like in terms of like the, the stuff I do in the gym, like um, the, way, the way I eat, like hydration. But, uh, like, yeah, people want to go out. Go now. Like, I mean, like, when I was young at Tottenham, the boys want to go out, let's go out. Do you want to drink? No. Well, you don't want to drink, Jane? No, I'm driving. Look, there's my keys. <laughs> I'm right, enjoy myself, have a little Red Bull, and like, keep me awake, and I go home. <laughs> I never, 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 ever. Not one of those footballers come at nightclub drunk and like because at the end of the day, yeah, we've got we might. This might be on a Saturday. Then the, the game. There's no midweek game, but there's a game the following. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, I need to be on it in training every day to be ready for the Saturday. Because come Saturday, I'm having a bad game. No one's no one's gonna be turning around and making it. No one's gonna be like, oh yeah, he had a bad game because. Oh, he went out with a but nah. Do you know what I mean? This for me, mm. I excuses. I didn't want to, I didn't want to sit there and be like, ah, oh, the reason I had a bad game because I did this and I did this and I did this. I'd rather sit there and be like, you know what? Yeah, I played good today because this is what I've done for the week and that. So I know I was gonna play good, sort of thing. So I never I never got involved in all of that. Yeah, and we um, actually spoke to Mick Bill and he said you're one of the most dedicated professionals he's ever seen. But speaking of Mick Bill, I just wanted to dial into him a bit. Um, how important is he in that setup? Because obviously he has a great connection with young players, and we've seen Joe Aribo, Ryan Kent, you know, all take to the SPL like duck to waters. How important is he behind the scenes? Because you know people are quick to pat Stephen Gerrard on the back, but how important is he? Oh, massive, massive! And you know what? He's really impressed me. You know, like. Um... And I'm not even saying this because he's probably he probably listened to this, but he's impressed, <laughs> he's impressed in a big way because I remember like um when I when I when I when I sat down and I spoke to Stevie before I signed to come to Rangers and stuff, he said to me, JD, like you might know Mick Bill. I said, Yeah, Mick, I remember trying Mick and that. He said, He is proper. He said, Trust me, <laughs> he's proper. And the way I see it is in terms of tactics and stuff like that. He, he is up there with like, when I, when I talk about that, like the coaches and that, like I've worked from some top managers and, and top coaches and stuff like that, but Mick is definitely up there. And he's so like, um, you know, just his, his, his attention to detail and how he sort of like put, puts his points across for people to sort of like understand. Um, Cause there's times, there's, there's times when I first got there, cause remember it's a different way of playing and stuff like that, play different systems, all that sort of stuff and that. And I was just, I thought to myself, wow. Cause I remember when, uh, like I met, if Alfredo got like uh, when he was suspended, right? So Mick come to me and said, JD, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna tweak the system to, uh, to so it's better for you. 
So I thought, okay, what are you going to do? So what are you, what are you done? Instead of playing, so if you play like a 4 3 3, let's say, yeah, and the wingers out wide and they're just, he said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to bring two number 10s in the middle so they're close to you. So if it's close to you, do you know what I mean? So, yeah. so, so, so you stay high, make your runs and stuff like that, but you don't, you're not fighting against people. So the two number 10s, not just one, there's two number 10s that are close to you. So it's easy for you. We did that. We've, we've not looked back. It's unbelievable. But the fact that he had that idea, and he did that. It's, it's genius, man. But I could, I could talk about Mick all day. I can show you some of the sessions that we do. But everything we do relates to how we're going to play on the weekend. Mm. You know I mean? right. and, and, and if you look at a lot of our players, a lot of our players that have, that have improved and gone to the next, for instance, like a Joe Rebo. Because remember, sometimes you come up here and people, they, they say things like, well, you played in England, you played in the Premier League or for Joe, like you played for Trump, blah, blah, blah. You might go to Scotland and, and it might be a little bit easier for you. But sometimes it doesn't matter. Like, what league you go, you have to settle in, you know, it's a different league, you're playing with different players. But the fact that, the, the, how much I've seen Joe Aribo improve already in a short space of time, um, amazing, man. That makes proper. Yeah, so final one on your spell in Scotland. How would you rate the standard? Because obviously in the league, some people are quick to besmirch it and, you know, almost laugh at it and say, oh, it's too easy. But we've spoken to a lot of coaches, you know, Greg Patterson, Mick yeah, Bill. Yeah. Stephen Reid's come on the platform and sort of said, yeah, that it's a decent standard. So how would you rate it? Because you've played at the very top table. Yeah, and it's one of those ones where you see people that, you see people that say stuff like that. They're not football people because for me, I always think that, they're not football people. <laughs> I, always, I always think that like, for you to turn around and be like, oh, it's, it's you. A lot of times, see, sometimes, for instance, if I played a game and that, and I, like for me, you got to make it, it's hard to make it look easy. It's not mm. easy. You can't just, go, you can't just turn up. And just be like, oh yeah, I just turn up on that. Like, oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna prepare myself how I used to prepare myself because I've come to Scotland. I'm not gonna do this what I used to do. Nah, you have to make it's not it's 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 a football match. Eleven v eleven, yeah. Up here, everyone wants to beat Rangers. So remember, when you play for Rangers, every team you play against, you're getting the best version of every player. Do you know what I mean? The weekend before, you might have watched, I, I, you might have watched highlights of them. Forget that. I don't want to play. If I like, forget about, forget what you see on the screen. But if they played against someone else, when they play against Rangers, they're bringing it. Because everyone wants to beat Rangers. The players, the players that are playing against us probably want to play for Rangers. So they want to... Mm. So, so I'm saying that. So you're getting... So the games are tough. They come to Ibrox. They make it difficult for us to break down. No block. Frustrate us. If they get a nil-nil for them, they've won the game. Do you know what I mean? The, ref, the referees... A, a lot of the times, even with the referees and that, sometimes I think, are you against us as well? Sort of thing. So that's the mentality we've got is everyone's against us. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But... But it's one of those ones where we believe that, well, the demands, when you play at Ibrox, you have to win and you have to win in style. That's the pressure. And that's the sort of pressure that I wanted at the back end of my career. Like yeah. Lots of winning games, knowing that every time I go out uh, on a Saturday afternoon or a midweek and that, you have to bring it because at the end of the day, it's a massive football club and you have to bring trophies. It's, 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 it's pressure. Sean. Ahead of the new season, obviously you're back in pre-season, training hard. What's the feeling in the camp? Because obviously you've lost the league, you know, to Celtic last season. Yeah. Do you think, you know, this season you can go one step further and actually win the title? Yeah, I think it's a massive season for everyone. I think the, the, import, the, the good thing is everyone knows how big it is. And, and I can sense that, like in training and the, the pre-season and how hard everyone's working. Everyone's putting it in, trying to tick every box. Uh, you know, with the coaching staff, the gaffer, you know, Mick, you know, Gary and Mac. We've, we've, we've had loads of meetings and videos and stuff like that. You know, we've highlighted the, the things that we did last season where we, you know, where we could improve, where we went wrong, you know, not wanting to make the same mistakes that we made last season, the second part of the season. And like I mentioned before, I look around at the dressing room and I think, Do you know what, we can go all the way. We can go all the way and compete in Europe as well. And compete in Europe. I don't know if you spoke to Mick about, even like we talk about, you know, people, we talk about stats and stuff like that. And, 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 and how football's moved on, it's all about keeping the ball mm. and uh, possession and all that sort of stuff, showing your quality. I mean, in Europe, if you look at the stats and that, I think, if anything, I think we're up there. I think we're number one in, in terms of stats with, you know, keeping the ball and stuff, mm. that sort of quality. So the players need to take a lot from that. And this is in, this is in Europe playing against the top teams, like the Portos. And so we just need to bring that in the, in the, in the league and, 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 and see what happens in that. But it's a massive season for us. So we want to move on, you know, to your embryonic stages of your career. Um, obviously, um, we're all aware that you kicked off at Semrab. Um, before we go into West Ham, yeah. we had a listener's yeah. question from um, at Johnny Brick, and he was like, ask Jermaine to pick a Semrab five-a-side team. <laughs> five-a-side team? 
Pressure. <laughs> wow. So it'd be so I'll play like me, Led the King, John Terry, Leon Knight, and uh maybe Bobby Zamora. Bobby played as well, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe Bobby Zamora. That's a proper team that you know. <laughs> yeah. Trust me. Kings of East London. <laughs> Simba, unbelievable man. Even even at, like I say to people, even when we were eight, I remember we used to wear. Everyone used to wear all the kids and that. They used to wear their, their little tracksuits and we used to wear suits. Simba, we used to wear suits with a Simba tie. You know what I'm playing, isn't it? <laughs> you know at half time when everyone used to have the oranges and all oranges. Mm. We had bananas. Wow. Yeah, but not we were different, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um and uh, I remember Leon Knight's uh, dad Bertie. Bertie was the manager. And the way we saw it at the time, like we were we were like AC Milan. Like no one's beating us. We used to win every we used to win everything. We used to win every, all the best players used to come to us, we used to win everything because we had to. That sort of pressure that our parents used to put on us. And we were eight, man. We was like proper professional training. I remember training, we was on it every day and training. And uh yeah, I, I love those days, man. Those days, I love those days. Yeah, so going into your West is obviously you forged a great relationship with Mr. Harry Redknapp. He's a manager that took you every everywhere. single way, <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> he took Jermaine, Crouchy, Nico, you know, there's that whole running joke. <laughs> so how was it like playing with Harry and why was that relationship so special? Oh, Harry, man, what a guy. Everywhere you should go, he'd be like, ah, my phone will ring like that, be private number. Be like, here we go. <laughs> Jay, it's Harry. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> you know what? You, know, spoke, you see Harry, yeah? You, see, you know he's speaking about man managing. Unbelievable. People used to, all the boys just be like, if there's a problem, oh, JD, go and talk to your dad. Like, boy, come on, the banter. Go and talk to your dad. <laughs> Listen, this is he, he never, he, again, never complicate anything with me. All he used to say to me is go and score goals. That's it. Go and score goals. Do what you do best. Don't worry about anything else. Just go and score goals. Like, because when you're doing it, you're the best. That's what he used to say to me. These are, these are the things he used to say to me. So when I used to play, all I wanted to do is impress him. I didn't want to let the manager down. Because this guy, remember this guy, when I was, eight, when I was 15, he was sending scouts out. I didn't even know this until recently. When I was 15, he was sending scouts out and basically said, there's a young kid. He's a clone of Ian Wright. Go and get him. He needs to be at West Ham. Because he'll be in this first. And then I remember I got to West Ham at 16. And I was like a sponge. Like, literally, there's no one that was more obsessed, even to this day, more obsessed with football than me. When I got to West Ham, I looked at, I looked at everyone around me, and I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm 16, but I need to be in the first team. So who's in front of me in the first team? It was like Paolo Wanchop, Ian Wright at the time, Paolo Di Canio, uh, Paul Kitson. So we'd be doing finishing in training. I remember we'd done a finishing session one time, and then Harry, I remember I scored one in training, and then Harry turned around to so the first team player, I was 16 and said, that's how you finish. So you can imagine, I'm sitting in the youth team dressing room, you know, so I'm finishing training. I'm going home and said, mom, if you hear what the manager said to me today, like, in front, like to, the, to the first team player. So you can, so all these things he used to do in me was confident. Like I was like, building my confidence and that, and I felt more comfortable training with the first team. When I was training with the first, I was scoring goals in training. And I made my debut at 17. I scored on my debut at 17 with my second touch. And then he just said to me, you're not playing reserve football. You're, I'm sending you alone to Bournemouth so you can come back and get his first team. Crazy. Mental, man. Mental. And, and you know what I wanted to ask you, Jermaine, is um, not, not including your brief loan spell, um, I think, in 2014. You had obviously two spells with, with, with Spurs uh, um, in 2004, 2008, and then um, uh, with Ben Hoddle, and then again, uh, 2009 to 2014 with, with, with Harry. Um, and you know what, what's really funny is that yeah, like your appearances and goals are almost identical. But, but, uh, it's the same. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the same. It so, to, that's mental. Yeah, it had to be because you know what it was? You see, when I, I always say to people, like, like I was going home. Because remember, when I, was at, so when I was at Portsmouth, obviously I went with Harry and I played in that unbelievable team with the Soul Campbell, Distan, Glenn Johnson, you know, David James, Kuli like, uh, Montari, Milan Barosh, Lasana Diara. So I said, Oi. yeah. So I'd be a part of that team. Harry left there and went to Tottenham. So I just knew it was a matter of time anyway. When I came back to Tottenham, I was so excited in that. I was so excited. I just, I just said, you know what? It's not me coming home. The Tottenham fans, the club dentist, right? He phoned me when I was at Portsmouth. This was just before the, the transfer window opened. And he put the phone, 
He, he, he said, JD, I'm at the game. He said, listen to this. And White Hart Lane was singing my name. And I was a Portsmouth player. Wow. wow. I remember telling my mum. And I saw my mum. She was like, that's crazy. That's mental. Get that sort of love from fans. It's like mad. So when I, had, when I got the opportunity to go back, I just thought, you know what? I just want to go back and just do exactly what I did before or even better. And the second spell for me, especially that 2010 season, that was the best football I've ever played. Okay. That's what I was going to ask you. What was your favourite <laughs> spell out of the two of them? But yeah, yeah. I imagine the second one was, was different, isn't it? Yeah, the, the second one was different than that because cause, cause, cause if you can imagine going somewhere where you get that, they appreciate you, the fans. And even times where there's times where sort of like, if I hadn't scored for a few games, the fans were always singing my name. So it was just for me, it was the perfect environment. I loved it at the club. And it was just like, uh, like I said, when I got the chance to go back, man, I was just like, yes, just, I said to my agent, just get the deal done. I want to go back. Yeah, when you speak to Spurs fans, you know, you're well revered at the club. Yeah. Even I got a good friend that's a Spurs fan. He said, he's my favourite striker at the football club. I remember that famous game against Wigan when you scored five. I mean, the array of finishing, slapping it, <laughs> dinking over the keeper. Bang, yeah. Like, yeah, man, you were slapping them in, Jermaine. So... <laughs> But you see that game, right? I say to people, and I say to young players, like you see all these things, but all the all the stuff I did in training, leading yeah. up to the, leading up to these moments, it weren't just it weren't just like we spoke about before about still playing at thirty seven and that. So everything I did in in training, every, every time I done finishing sessions, I don't I'm, I want one of those players that would do finishing. So you know, if you get defenders doing a finishing session and the ball comes to them, they have one touch, they'd have another touch and they'll shoot. It's not realistic. If you're gonna now come a finishing session, do a finishing session so it's realistic. So it's, so it's exactly how you're going to see it in a game. And that's what I was like. I was a stable hand training with, uh, with Clive Allen. And then literally, Clive used to just get the balls and he would just say to me, right, just react. Wherever I throw the ball, just react and finish. And that's all we did. I just loved it. I used to do it every single day. So all those, when you see all the goals, especially that night against, against Wigan, it's all, stuff, it's all the stuff I did in training. And a lot of the, a lot of the goals, you see them, like um, I think the... The fourth when I when it, when it sort of like come off the post, the fifth when I went across the goalkeeper <laughs> side netting. Yeah. It's like the second one again across the keeper side netting. So it's just like you get into those positions and you're just familiar with it and it's instinctive. Bang, you know exactly what to do. Jermaine, so at Tottenham, you played with a plethora of strikers, you know, Adebayor, yeah. Pavlichenko, a lot of players. So which one would you say was the best to play with? I'm probably Berbatov because just, just how he would just. Just how good he was, you know, his touch, he's sort of like, I always felt like he was always, you know, on the wavelength sort of thing, because all the top, where all I had to do, I need to be on it, because if my movement, if I'm on it, and my movement's how it should be, my movement's good and that, I believe he will find me. And I always enjoy playing with Berbatov. I remember even with Berbatov and Keane, they had an unbelievable, like, partnership. Um, but it was just, it was a joy to play with and that, because he was unselfish as well. And he wishes to say to me, he used to look at me and say, make sure, JD, when I get him, just make sure you move. And he was sliding in and I'll just finish and, and and he was he was he was brilliant to play with. But you mentioned like obviously Pavlyuchenko, who was probably like a similar to me, like a number nine, you know, all he wanted yeah, to in box. Add, add yeah. your, like, like a the, vo the 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 vocal point of the team where like um I don't know, like a Berbatov was more like a ten who would yes, yes. happen. Everything come up to him, he sticks, first touch is the best I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it was unbelievable. Um, was it the same in training as well, Jermaine? Was he picking him out of the sky in training? It didn't run in training, though. Uh, Berber, no, I don't know. If, I don't know if you've, if you've done Rio in that. Berber did not move in training. <laughs> he did not move in training in that. But in games, he was just like he was. He was good player, man. Very good. Yeah, I think I'm just gonna you know chime in with a listener question because I think Dej actually asked the first part of this question. But this is from at Teski, and he was like, "How does he think he would have?" fared in today's game where the majority of teams play a 4-3-3 using wide forwards? Yes, yeah, it's, it's fine. I, I, played, I, played, I played that at Sunderland for, for two seasons. I scored 15 league goals back-to-back. Mm. -back. Come on. Yeah, it's one of those ones where... Numbers. Like, uh, numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like... It's, 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 and, and it's one of those ones where you think, you know what, it's, it's, uh, if you're getting chances, you're going to score. I've always believed that. I've always said to the boys, you know, just give me a chance. And I, was, I always wanted to be that player that, that my teammates can look at and be like, yeah, get JD one one chance and he will score. And it was and 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 with the two with the the teams that played the four three three and 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 and, and two wingers just get in the box. You just, you know what I mean, you you have to you have to adapt you have to adapt your game sometimes. I mean, even I mentioned before we played with the two tens close to me. I 
played with, I played, I played up front on my own, isolated, and I've managed it. Um, but it'd be, I mean, it'd be, it'd be fine. I, I watch the game. I watch uh, all different teams play. You watch, you watch Liverpool the six season. Listen, you still, you still, you still get your goals. It's, it's, uh, it'll be fine. You know what, Jermaine? I wanted to ask just on Sunderland, right? Because I remember, um, I think I was, it was an interview that I watched of yours when you were talking about um, scoring in that uh, time, time where derby. Yeah. Um, and you were saying that like that goal was like what like your f- uh, one of if not your favorite goal and even brought you to tears. Yeah. And and what was it about that goal? Like why was that so special? Uh, out of all of the other goals that you scored, I know for the club it was important yeah. because it, it sort of ended a, a an eight uh, game um, streak where 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 the club didn't win. But yeah. for you personally, why was that such an important goal? Because you know what it was? I think it was sort of like, when I went up there, I swear everyone talked about it. That's all the boys spoke about. It's the Derby Day, JD. It's the Derby Day, blah, 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 against Newcastle. And I always knew that before anyway. I knew the importance of the, of the game and stuff like that. And it's just, I remember get, being on, like, getting up in the morning, being excited and that. And it, it was a different feel. It felt like cup final day where the, the, you, get, you come at the, the hotel, you go for a walk and that, and you get on the bus and you've got the police escort, the horse, arrive at the stadium game, even going up to the stadium and that everyone was on the streets. I see all the little kids in that. So I sat there and thought, wow, this is so important to the fans. This day is so important to the fans. And I thought, you know what? I want to be the difference. Like, I want to be the difference. It was my real, real, my first real taste of it, but I want to be the difference. And I want people to be talking about me in years to come. And I don't know, I just had this, it's weird and that I just had this feeling. I knew something was going to happen for me on that day. And then uh, getting to the ground and that, and literally, a lot of times you get to the stadium and it was just like, uh, you see the fans coming in that uh, day. Like, all the fans were there early. They're all outside. They come off the and they roar. So I thought, right, I just got, you know when you get the goosebumps and that? Yeah, yeah. Angel, I'm ready to go. I was fired up. And to be fair, even when you see the goal, even the, the reason why I hit it, I hit it first time on the volley, I was tired. <laughs> so much, that first half, I knew it was hot. I was probably, because I was so excited about the game, oh, I was oh, running that I didn't even need to be doing. And I remember the ball just, Dropping that goal, you know what? I'm just gonna hit it. And literally, as soon as it hit my foot and it just fell now, I thought, Pfft. you know, one of those moments I thought, what, like, you're so grateful because it could have been anyone, mm. even anybody. your celebration. You didn't really yeah. know what to do, it was that <laughs> <laughs> And then I just felt this, and then the whistle went for half time, and then even like, just the roar. And I just started, like, I don't know, I just got emotional because mm. I was so happy. I just got emotional on that because these things, like you dream of these things when you're a kid. Do you know what I mean? For me, it wasn't even about like money, cars, how, mm. nah, I just wanted to play football and score goals and just show people how good I am in front of a big crowd. My family were there. Like it was, it was just an amazing day. No, nah, that was a jump. Like we all remember it. And obviously just harping back to um, Tottenham briefly, um, we've got a listener's question from Tapping Tobbs from Tapping Football. He asks, why did he leave so damn early in that 13, 14 season? <laughs> he was still a solid striker and we needed him and Adebayor despite spending on Soldado. So how do you answer that, Jimmy? Do you know that season, right? I remember before I went to Toronto, that, was, that, that season, I remember scoring a lot of goals in the Europa League um, and I felt sharp. I scored a lot of goals in the Europa League. I, scored, I remember we went away to Villa in a cup. I scored two, two again. And it was, I felt stronger then than I probably did three years before that because how I managed my body, how I understood my body a lot more, what, what I needed in training. Um, ABB was a manager before Tim Sherwood took over. Yeah. And what happened was I had a deep conversation with the chairman because I never thought I was going to leave Tottenham, but I had a deep conversation with the chairman and the money that Toronto offered the football club for my age was unbelievable. So at the end of the day, sometimes... Typical Daniel Levy, yeah? yeah sometimes... <laughs> <laughs> Street <laughs> businessman. Yeah. Yeah. The business. As soon as Daniel says to me about the money, I'm going. <laughs> but he said that, that. And to be fair, he said, to me, he said, you know what, JD? He said, like, you've been unbelievable here. He said, you can always come back here. The fans love you. We love you here, but blah, blah, blah. you've got nothing to prove. He said, you know what? I feel like you deserve it. Um, going over there, like a, a new challenge. Uh, they gave me a four-year contract. So like for both parties, it was just like perfect at the time. But even when I left for it, I didn't really want to leave. So I didn't, because I, mm-hmm. I just thought I'd be there to the like, end of my career, to be honest. Jermaine, how is it like working with Daniel Levy? Because he's a polarised figure amongst Tottenham fans. You know, 
people call him an Enoch out saying that they're not investing or they're not transparent. From your dealings with him, what would you say he's like? Because he's sort of like, you know, mystique figure. You see him in the press box, you know, with his glasses, he's looking right over now. the action. So yeah. how is he? Daniel's cool. He's actually all right, you know. But that's what I'm saying about from the outside, how people look. Mm. Because, because I think with me, because I was there such a long time, so I had, I had a good relationship with Daniel. Um, it, was, it was cool. Like, I mean, he lived around the corner from my house in London. So it was like... Um, I mean, he was, he was cool with me, do you know what I mean? Because he knew what he was getting. At the end of the day, he knew, for me, he knew I loved the fo- First and foremost, I love football. And I love the football club. He wasn't one of those ones where I'm coming to get the money that I'm just going to go. Do you know what I mean? It, I was yeah. there a long time. I had a relationship. He respected me. And, I, and, and it was... But obviously, I understand. Because I, I remember a lot of Spurs friends. Yeah, yeah. Things that they say. And, um, and, they, and, and a few people said to me, how come the players are always saying, oh, Daniel's cool, blah, blah, blah. But from the outside... The Spurs fans are like, yeah, but he's, he's, he's ruining the club. He's not investing. Mm. Like, remember, especially, it should be a perfect time to be at a football club with a new stadium. Yeah. But they, they feel like they're going backwards instead of going forward. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, it's a difficult one. But in terms of Daniel, I mean, as a person, he's, 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 he's cool. He's a businessman, isn't he? So, yeah. <laughs> 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 Got to get that. <laughs> he's a businessman. He's not going to change. And... It's just, it's, I mean, it's, you just got to see what happens in that. But it would, at some point, you know, I would love to see the football club, you know, invest and get in, get in the best players. And, and I'd love to see, you know, you know, see them go on and win, and win trophies. It would be amazing. Moving on to your time at Bournemouth, Eddie Howe, you know, brought you in. Um, we've recently spoke to Jordan Ive and he said he just didn't work out for him at Bournemouth. And in my opinion, I don't think it really worked out for you personally. A lot of players, yeah. Yeah. What do you think is going wrong at Bournemouth? Because they're in big trouble this season. Yeah, they're in, but do you know what it was with me? When I went there, I just got back in the, in the England squad. I was at Sunderland. Yeah. I went there on a free. I just got back in the England squad. So you can imagine, like when Gareth Southgate phoned me, I thought, oh, like in, like in my 30s. Never thought this was going to happen. And then Gareth phoned me and basically said to me, JD, when I look at the stats, you, Jamie Vardy and Harry Kane are the highest English goal scorers, and it's been like that for a while, because obviously we mentioned my, my 15 goals back to Pat for Sunderland, but the stats and stuff like that. So I said, how do you feel coming back in? You've got a chance of playing against Lithuania at Wembley, which, which I, obviously I did, and I, and I scored and everything. But, so I was going to Bournemouth on a high, you know, really looking forward to it, going, looking forward to being in a team that's, got, that's full of energy, create a lot of chances. Mm. And literally within about, honestly speaking, the, the, the first few months, I thought, you know what? It's it's strange, and I just thought, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know why um, the manager wanted me here because I understand. Obviously, they had uh, Joshua King, Callum Wilson, who the manager obviously loves, um, Lee Smuset. Um, so I just thought to myself, like, no disrespect to anyone else, and at the same time, I, I went into the football club thinking, you know what? It's good because at least I can try and help the younger players as well. But at the same time, I want to play football. Because I was used to playing football at Sunday, I want to I want I want to play football. I'm not going to sort of like be a mentor. Yeah. I'll do that side of it. But I want to do that anyway to help people. You know, Bennett Kofobi was there and that. But for me, it just it, I mean it it just didn't work out. I just I just didn't I never I never felt a part of it once. And I felt like I was being told to do things in games that I've never done before, which was really strange in that because I mean if you look when I, when if I sit there and look at all the managers I've played for and I've looked at my record and stuff, I've scored goals everywhere. But for me, there's a feeling outside, you know, Bournemouth corridors that it's a bit like an old boys club that Eddie Howe likes to play players that he knows, that he's brought players up through the leagues uh, to manage, you know, the superstars. Like, again, you've hit the dizzy heights in football. Jordan I was coming from a big club. Would you agree with that? Do you know what? Do you know what? It's one of the, you know what it is with me, yeah? You see, like, with, with, um, with with Jordan, obviously, I was there with, I was, I was there with Jordan and that. And there was times when I felt like he, he should have played, to be fair. like Because there was times in training, it would be unplayable. So much potential. And I think, you know, he deserves a chance. But for whatever reason, it never happened for him. And the same thing happened with me, where it got to... it got the, towards the, I felt like I was forced out, to be honest. Okay. Because towards the end, I remember sitting there and I'm thinking, OK, then, if, if someone's playing in front of me, they're doing more scoring goals. No problem. No problem. Because it was all about the team winning. But it got, to, it got towards the end when I wasn't even getting on the pitch. But I'm talking about not getting on the pitch. Next game, not getting on the pitch. 
bringing on younger players in front of me, not getting on the pitch. Different system, so, so playing a different system and not even, there was one game we played, I think Joshua King up front, he played like um, Brian Fraser as the 10. Oh yeah. So, yeah. I thought, so, so, so I thought, okay then, I know what's going on here. So I felt like I was getting forced out for whatever reason, never caused a problem there, always try to, like we spoke about, being a mentor, trying to give something back and helping the younger players, all this sort of stuff. So for me, I just felt like, when I look at it now, I just felt like, you know what, maybe if I was with Eddie from the beginning, he would appreciate me more than the finished article, if you like. The finished article, Jermaine felt actually going to Bournemouth, where maybe he felt like mm. he, he couldn't coach me in that. So just, I don't know, it just, it, that's, that, that's, how it, that's how it felt. But it was just, it was, it was really, really strange. I didn't enjoy it at all. Well, so Jermaine, are you saying that like, Eddie probably struggles to build relationships because um, I listened to Matt Davis Adams on the Totally Football Show um, not too long ago, and he was ben, saying ben as well. I listened to Glenn Johnson the other day. Yeah, yeah on Talksport. Yeah, yeah. In terms of like integrating new signings, he doesn't really know how to build trust with them. At the end of the day, like I mentioned before, I spoke to you about Stephen Gerrard managing me, man managing me. JD, you don't need to come out and train today. There's times where I've had problems that JD, because he knows what I'm like. I always want to, I don't want to miss a training session. <laughs> no, 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 no. We need you, we need you for Saturday. You're playing Saturday. Make sure you're, just make sure you're ready. Manage yourself. You come and tell, he, the, Stevie says to me, JD, you come and tell me what you need. Right? Harry Redknapp, never complicate anything. JD, because when you're doing it, there's no one better than you. Sam Allardyce used to look at me and be like, we used to be in meetings sometimes. We'll finish the meeting, he'll look at me in front of everyone and be like, if you don't score tomorrow, he used to put that pressure on me, but, but, I, used to, but I took it, I took it. I'd be like, because the manager believes that I can score in every game. They didn't complicate anything. Then all of a sudden, you go somewhere and you feel like, do you know what? You don't really appreciate me. And I'm being, I'm being asked to do things that I've never done before. Do you know what I mean? The training, how you want me to play in game. And it, for me, it, was just, it, it, just, it, just, it just did not work out for me. It did not work out for me. And a lot of people asking a lot of questions. What happened? And... I don't know. I didn't. I didn't really have. I didn't really have a relationship with Eddie. To be honest, never. Well, that's what Jordan said as well. Like, I didn't really. I didn't really have. Never spoke to, to Eddie. I didn't so really you... have, like, like I didn't really have a relationship with him. But and obviously, he didn't, to be fair, he didn't stand in my way when I obviously when when uh, obviously I came to Rangers. He didn't stand in my way because he couldn't because he said to me he didn't want to be that manager that sort of like that at the sort of like back end of my career that's that's going to sort of like hold me back or spoil what I've done in the game sort of thing. And I thought, okay, cool, no problem. But um, I never, I never moaned. That he used to, I, I just trained. I trained the same every day, even when I went playing. There was times he would stop the session and be like, you, like the younger players, that like, you need to train like this. This, like, do you know what I mean, he's thirty plus, and like this and that. So, but, but it was just, it was just weird. Never got, never really got the opportunity in that. Didn't feel appreciated, and 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 it just, it just never worked out. Mm. Do you know what, um, Jermaine? You mentioned obviously. Uh, training with with Josh King, Callum Wilson, Jordan Ibe, and so on and so forth. The one player that I wanted to ask you about was uh, Nathan Ake. Now, obviously, before going to Bournemouth, he had a spell at Chelsea that didn't quite work out, and he's and he's been a, a pillar in in the heart of the defence for for Bournemouth. Um, and of course, he's caught in a lot of interest at, at the moment. Um, so, I guess I wanted to ask you, how, how, like, how how highly do you rate him, and do you feel like he could go? And, and walk into one of the top clubs um, in, in the Premier League? I'd love, I'd love to see him at Tottenham. Because you know what? Yeah, of course you would. <laughs> at Tottenham, because you know what? He's got so much potential. And uh, coming from Chelsea, obviously it was difficult to get in a team there. Um, I mean, he went to Watford. And, uh, he, he, and then Bournemouth paid a big fee. It was about 20 million Bournemouth paid for him. So, so yeah, but someone that's... Uh, Technically, obviously, Dutch players that technically they're always good. Um, you know, scores a lot of goals from set pieces. Really brave for someone that's not. I was really brave in a box and stuff like in both boxes, which is which is which is good. And uh, and away from that, he's one of the nicest guys I met in football. Like, is one of the nicest guys I met in football. He's one of those ones you let him you you let him date your sister. One of those ones. Okay. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's that nice and that, but like, um, but I can see him. I can I can see him obviously going to the next level. I love to see him go to the next level, and uh, you know playing at, playing at the top level. You know playing for Holland, trying to get in that team. Uh, you know playing in the Champions League and stuff like that. I feel I feel like he's I feel like he's good enough for sure. Yeah. So Jermaine, um, final form of what do you think happens to them at the end of the season? It's very very precarious. They've conceded you know five and four goals. 
you know, it doesn't look good. No. Do you think they're going to go down? Do you know what it is, right? Um, I think sometimes you have to be not realistic in that, but I think if you look at the, you look at the fixtures and, that, and they've got they've got difficult games and and if you look at I know obviously the manager is coming out and he's he's saying the things that he has to say, he has to say and remember a lot of the, a lot of the boys are still my friends and I speak to Junior Stanislas and that who's an unbelievable guy Charlie Daniels I still speak to a lot of the boys and that and to be fair they the lads deserve to play in the Premier League because they're a lot of them are top players, a lot of them are top players and that and it's really difficult to obviously see the team suffer like that. I'm not talking about the manager, I'm talking about the players who are my friends. Do you know what I mean? So, I don't know, it's, it's difficult, but I think when you look at the, when you look at the fixtures and that they've got some tough games, obviously they've got Tottenham next, which is, I know people can say, you know, Tottenham are not firing at the minute and that and the way they're playing and stuff like that, no intensity. But at the same time, it's a difficult game. Um, and I believe that uh, if they do go down, it'd be difficult because you look at the, the, the players that I've just mentioned, like the Callum Wilsons, who's, who's currently in the England squad, Joshua King, full international. So what's going to happen with these players? Are these players going to go to Nathan Ackes and that? So you've got a situation where the players leave and then you have to rebuild to try and get yourself back up into the Premier League, which is, again, a difficult job because before, years ago, you can say about the Championship and the Premier League and the gap was so big. But now, I mean, when you look at the Championship and look at the teams in the Championship, that like is a competitive and it's a tough, tough division to actually get out of. Every game's difficult, a lot of games, two games a week and stuff like that. So... It's not a good time for the football club at the minute. I know they're suffering. Um, it's a lot of pressure. I've been there at Sunderland. It's a lot of pressure, and I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be hard. It, it'll be, it's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult. Now, just in the interest of time, Jermaine, of course, there's a, a lot more questions that we want to ask, but we did promise that we would give um, some time for uh, listeners' questions. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to kick off with with one. And, and this is from uh, at Reggie Nelson underscore 10. He, he, he asks, growing up in the academy system and particularly being from East London, do you feel like the academy uh, game places enough emphasis on education? If not, what more do you think can be done to pair education and full-time football? Well, they, when, they, when they say educate me, no. Um, he didn't really specify, but I assume he's talking about like, um, you know, uh, scholars and people that are coming through the academy also like um, having time that they're, 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 they're dedicating to getting their GCSEs and... and, and it's important. I still, I still, yeah, it's, I, I still feel like that's important and stuff like that. Maybe they can do more. I remember when I was in that situation, when I was 16, we used to go to college once a week, um, which is, was, was, was part of being a YTS at the time, uh, because it's something that you need. Not only that as well, I feel like, again, when you're being... Realistically, when you when you think about a group of, of scholars or, or YTS that was called at the time, how many players are going to come through? What two, two, mm. one or two players of each group is going to come through? And 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 these are things that it's it's always been like that because when you look at because when I was at West Ham and you look at who came through in, in Rio and Frank Rio and Frank came through at there, yeah, Joe Cole, and Michael Carrick came through, you know, then I came through, then Glenn Johnson came through, so it's always one or two players, two at the so then it's important for players, you know, the, the, the other end, the players that fall out of the game, they have to, they have, to have something to fall back on. Mm. And I feel like if the club can set that up for them, it's so important. And even if it's like a sports science or, or like a coaching thing, it's so important because at least then they can stay in the game. They want to be around the game and that. They might not make it as, 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 as players, but at the same time, they're still in the game. They're still doing mm. something in the game, which is important. Um, we've got another listener question, and this is from RFC David seventeen eighteen. Who would win in an arm wrestling round, you or Alfredo? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll win. Come on, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the East of London. You think I want to turn around? No way. You crazy? Well, my cousin, my cousins watch this, and my cousins are. Funny, my. No, <laughs> <laughs> what though? He's strong though. He, Alfredo, he's, he's he's a he's a strong he's a strong boy. He's very strong. There's another question from Anthony Hay. If you could play with one of Greenwood or Rashford, who would you choose and why? 
Mm. I play with both. Like I love Marcus Rashford because obviously I've 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 I played with him in England, trained with him, and he's always impressed me. Unbelievable potential. You know, he scores goals, quick feet, he's quick, he can do everything. Greenwood obviously still young and what he's shown already, I mean, like the, the two goals that he scored the other day, I was like, mm. wow, that's that's special because the way he took the goals with no no back lifting, mm. I, I love stuff like that. Finishes from tight angle, calculated finishes. I love stuff like that. And he seems like one of those players. He don't need. He, all he needs is the one chance, and he will score. He's quite ruthless in that, and 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 I love that. And so, I don't know. It's it's. I mean, I'd love to play. I'd love to play with both. It's a difficult question because they're both players that will, well, I believe that will go on and 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 become legends of that football club. Then, um, next question is from at Mister Underscore John Doe. Um, Defoe, what are your honest thoughts on your England career? Is it strange be, being managed by an old teammate slash opponent in Steven Gerrard? My England career, you know what? Blessed. Like At the end of the day, I always said, even if I play for England once, I'll be grateful. And to play for England that many times, score 20 goals, which a lot of players haven't done. Um, you know, playing a major tournament, go to two tournaments. Um, it was it was good, but obviously I'm going to turn around and be like, and I'm probably not the only player that will say this. Um, there was times where I felt like I was really flying. I was playing some of the best football, but no. But I always knew going away from England, I'm not going to play. I'll be on the bench, probably come on, get a cap and stuff like that. But well, why though? Because we spoke to thought, Andy Cole and Les, and they were like, they don't understand why they haven't mad. really got the love. Yeah, it's mad. But we're even a bit of Les one. We watch Euro 96. I remember watching Euro 96 and even watching it throughout the lockdown. And I remember some of the games in that where they were struggling for a goal. Um, and I thought, well, Les is on the bench and that, and you're bringing on other people. And I'm thinking, Les was scoring goals consistently. Andy Cole, who was that goal machine, righty. When righty got, when, when righty got left out, Italian night, Ian Wright. One of finishers, one of the greatest finishers the Premier League's ever seen, right? But left that Italian nightly, you know, you know what I mean? So it was like, Graham Taylor calling him in the office and I'm not taking you to the World Cup. What? Why? Do you know what I mean? So when he won the golden boot. So... All these things and that, it's, it, it was, I just believed that, you know what, I wasn't going to be any different. It happened to these players, I wasn't going to be any different and that, but I believe there was times, even... Um, so, Jermaine, let's call it out. Do you think there was institutional racism within the Football Association? I, I think, that, I, bro, I think, I think there's a lot of stuff going on because, because, like I mentioned before, we spoke off air about it and even, like, I remember we played against... Um, so, obviously, I've done my stuff for England, done my stuff. I remember Roy Hudson was the manager. Yeah. And then, uh, then he was sort of like bringing people through, like the Ricky Lamberts, and just bringing everyone through. And it's almost like then, but as they're bringing people through, they just push you, sort of thing. Like, hold on a minute. But I've been I've been scoring goals for years, consistently in the Premier League. All of a sudden, these players come along, like, and they just, and you just push them through, and you just just push me to the side. And that I remember sitting there thinking, wow, like, do you know what I mean, being treated like that, and that, and I just thought, okay, there's not much you can do. And I always wanted to play for England, so I didn't want to be one. I didn't want to turn around and be like, you know what, I'm just going to re retire in national football because at the end of the day, it's one of those ones. Managers come and go, yeah. right? Come and go. So I thought, so what? I, I, I was sort of like hoping at some point maybe a new manager will come in because under Fabio Capello, he played me. He played me because he appreciated my movement and the goals and stuff like that. And I enjoy playing under Fabio. Some players, some players probably don't even like Fabio, but I enjoy playing under Fabio because he because because he played me, but. There was loads of times for England. I felt like I should have played in that, and I was just sort of like, I'm "Not gonna, not gonna play." Or I'd, I'd play, score goals, and then the next game, certain people come back from injury and stuff like that. You're not gonna play. You can be on the bench. You're playing well for your club, scoring goals, and then you go to England, not even get on the pitch. So it was, it was, it was, it was tough, man. Okay. Wow. So I think this is an interesting one actually because we spoke to Sylvan Distan. And he said he's almost disenfranchised with the game because there's no coaching opportunities. So this question is from at Spurs Views. What's your plans post-playing, Jermaine? Would management or punditry inter interest you? Club ambassador, perhaps? I'm doing all three. The, <laughs> thing, the pundit stuff, one of my pals from Sky, Sky, Adam, legend, love him. So I've done a lot of the pundit stuff and stuff like that. So um, I'll probably, I'll do a little a, a bit of pundit stuff. So I love talking about football and I know the game. I'm going to do my badges. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do my badges because at the end of the day, I'm not going to let anyone stand in my way. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to think, you know what? I'm not because I don't believe I'm going to get an opportunity. I'm just going to get it done and see where it takes me. But when I look at the lack of black managers and coaches and not, I'm not, I'm not just talking about 
black managers and black coaches. I'm talking about black people in general in football, in a football environment. Because hold on a minute, at a football club, you've got you've got a manager, you've got you've got assistant manager, you've got coaches, you've got physio, you've got masseurs, masseuses, yeah? you've got people that work do the admin, the football club. So when 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 you when you when you look at the lack of black people in football clubs and that, of course you, you think, wow, like at some point something has to change. So when this time I watched his interview and when he's talking, I think, wow, it's bad because everything you're saying, I thought the same thing. Wow. I thought the same, I've, I've, I thought the same thing. I thought, what's the point? At times I thought, what's the point with doing my badges when I'm gonna waste my time doing my badges and I try and get a job like Sol Campbell and like Dwight York, when and Dwight, the legend Dwight York, CB, unbelievable, what he's achieved in a game, right? When he wanted to try to get the job at Aston Villa, in fact, trying to get an interview at Aston Villa and it was just, and they just, just bust them to now. Nah, we don't want you go and get experience. What do you mean go and get experience? How? Mm-hmm. Alex Ferguson, <laughs> Sir Alex Ferguson calling up Aston Villa to try and give him the through ball. And even <laughs> Sir Alex Ferguson, they didn't want to, they just didn't want to know. This is Dwight York. So when I when I when I see and hear things like this, of course you're like, wow. But then you think yourself, you know what? I'm I'm gonna do my badges and then and see where it takes me in that because I believe, especially a lot of a lot of clubs that I play for and the relationship that I've still got with the people there and stuff like that, I'd love to think at some point when I'm ready, I'll get an opportunity somewhere. Um, and sort of like, and I can, and basically as a manager or as a coach, do your stuff. Well, so Jermaine, do you believe that this, you know, moment in time with the Black Lives Matter movement, do you think this is going to spark some serious change or lip service? I think a lot of stuff lip service. It's a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of stuff's been lip service mm. over the years, all the campaigns and stuff like that. Beginning of the season, you do the, the team picture, <clears throat> team pictures over the years it, like do you know what I mean and you hold the kick it out and all that mm. sort of stuff and then, and then what do you know what I mean a lot of it's been lip service because because if that wasn't the case then a lot of stuff that's been going a lot of stuff that's still going on now it won't happen you know you go you play like the, the boys I see the boys playing with England and that stuff like that and, and, I'm, and they're, they're subjected to all this racism and then what happens these these countries and that or clubs or whatever they get a little slap on the wrist don't do that again and then, then they get a little slap on the wrist <laughs> The punishment has to be severe. Do you know what I mean? This is like it, I'm, I'm seeing I'm seeing things now. And I'm speaking to my family members and I'm speaking to my mum, all the stuff that's gone on and that. And, it's all, and my mum's like, it's like the 60s again. I'm like, mum, really? She, mom said to me, it's like the 60s. That's how, how it feels at the minute. I'm like, this is 2020. 2020. And my mom's telling me it feels like the 60s again. So it's, it's like, so if anything. Well, so we've, as, as a society, we've just gone backwards. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's hard, man. It's, it's, not, it's not nice and that. And, and it, at the end of the day, I would like to think at some point with this Black Lives Matter movement, at some stage, sooner rather than later, things, things have got to change. Uh, well said, Jermaine. And I just wanted to ask a personal question about the England fold. You know, we're all getting excited. We've got, you know, marvellous talents. Greenwood, Foden, Sterling still there, Rashford. I'm, you know, still a bit worried about the defence because I think it needs some tweaking. But as a proud Englishman, do you think England will win like a major trophy in the next four to eight years? I'd love to think so. When you look at the attacking options that we've got, it's amazing. I was chatting to Mick about it today. And Mick, me, Mick, we were saying about like when you look at the, the Sancho, Sterling, Rashford and Harry Kane and you think just... So, you know, Mick was saying that he would play, he would play all of them. Get your best players on the pitch. Even if you play Harry Deepart, play Rashford, and they play the two, Sterling and Red, like, get the best players on the pitch. And then, um, obviously, speaking to Mick and that, and, you, and, and it's one of those ones, you need the right balance. Because at the end of the day, you can't score, you can't concede five, and then score six. Do you know what I mean? So, it's, yeah. it's like, um, I would like to, what they showed me in the, in the, in the World Cup, though, was, was, was good. To get to a semi final of a World Cup was, was, in terms of confidence, it was good. Um, and, I mean, especially in tournaments as well, you need a little bit of luck and stuff like that. You need to get off to a good start. Um, and I'd love, to, I'd love to see that. It'll be nice. I'd love to see the boys win something, man. Because can you imagine? England, if we won a major tournament, it'd be part, it'd just be unbelievable. Mm-hmm. It'd be unbelievable, man. So, yeah, I believe it'd, be, it'd be nice. Last question from me, um, Jermaine, and this is from RFCNC72. How does it feel to be so idolised by the Rangers supporters? It's, do you know what? It's mad because obviously I've always known how big Rangers is, how big the football club, all the great players that I play for this football club. So I said to someone, I said, you know what? It's, made, it's mad because all I wanted to do is come here and make an impact and show people how good I am. 
And all they say to me is they say, you know what? We wish you came years ago. Like they appreciate you. And cause they know that I, 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 like I appreciate the opportunity coming to a football club like this, the back end of my career. And they know I love scoring goals. I give everything every game. Um, I know the importance of every game. I know the importance of wearing that badge, you know, and the, the, the fans up here, the passion is like on another level. Um, and I love that. And it, it's, it's a special feeling because, I mean, it's not, it, it's, not an, it's not an easy place to play because the demands, they, they demand that you play well. Like if you're winning one nil at half time, and you're going in and think you're going to get cheered. No, it's not. Come on, do you know what I mean? Like, you need to win with style sort of thing, playing for Rangers. Um, and, and that's why it's such a massive season for us. But it's a, it is a, it's a nice feeling to, to be appreciated, especially so soon. So I've not been there that long, really. Um, it's, it's, it's special. Yeah, and one of my friends personally asks about Mason Greenwood. Do you believe that this boy is the truth? You know, is he a generational talent? Because, yeah. you know, some of his finishing is reminiscent of you. You know, left foot, right foot. Dinks, yeah. slapping it, side nettings. Yeah, it's calculated finishing, and that's what I love. I, 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 when people talk, when people, like sometimes people say to me, oh, JD, you see that goal and that overhead kicks and that. But I said, you see with an overhead kick, it's overhead kick, but it goes anywhere. Do you understand? But yeah. a lot of times you can't really, you, don't, you can't really master overhead. When you do that, it's like, so those sort of goals, but when I've seen Greenwood and I've seen that like, he's finishes and that like, people, he's in a box and that, and you think sometimes you can't go past the defender. I always say to people, Wait for the defender to, they have to block a shot, which means the goalkeeper's unsighted. Goal, goalkeeper can't see. A lot of times they have to try and block the shot. Their legs are open. Go between their legs. The goalkeepers can't react. Also, so I'm seeing all these little things that he's doing in, he's doing, moving the ball, hitting it quick, no back lift across the goalkeeper, both feet, clean strikes, always hits the target. You know, his movement, because the first goal the other day against Bournemouth, for me, I'm not just looking at the finish. I'm looking at the movement to get that step forward. And you see the defender, Anna Smith, when he steps, as soon as he steps in that and just backs off, he's got the little, the little yard that you need to get your shot off. If he didn't do that movement, then he would have to face him and beat him. But the fact that he'd done that opposite movement and he got the, and he got the touch and the finish, I love stuff like that. that. That one thing he showed me that, yeah, he's got it. Ah, oh, Jermaine, big up yourself, brother, man. You're Honestly, a legend. Man, no, us, legend, bro, man. legend. We don't want to take too much more yeah, of your man. time. Yeah, on, but we definitely have to do a part two when this corona is blown we over. Do. We Maybe do. we come up to Rangers, Scotland. Because <laughs> you're going to be still bagging up goals, man. <laughs> <laughs> you, should, you should come up. You should come up to the game and come to the training ground. The manager, so Steve, he would love it. Oh. Yeah, hundred percent. We want to yeah, get him for the hundredth episode. <laughs> <laughs> he's funny. He, he, he's he's funny in that. But like, um, even sometimes in training, he joins in some of the possessions in that. Still got it. Still, still doesn't lose the ball in it. No, it's a genius. I still got it. I still, I still got it. <laughs> <laughs> crazy. <laughs> No, hundred percent. We 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 got to do this again, um, Jermaine. Man, it's it's impossible to talk about your whole career in in an hour and a bit, man. It's you know, but even like it's difficult, isn't it? Because that's even like that's what I do really. Even with my cousin, that like, we just sit there and talk about football. Even some of the young mm -hmm. lads, I was telling them some stories today about certain players I play with, and they're like, "Ah, oh, JD, I can listen to your story." Because I said to them about when I played with, I didn't mention that Paddy Di Canio, who was massive for me. Mm -hmm. um, at the time when I was at West Ham, Wrighty was big because Wrighty, what we used to do, I used to be finishing with Wrighty and he used to, he used to, he used to say to me, JD, you see your timing? Because I was so, I was just eager. I just wanted to get in the box and that. He said, no, nah, it's all about timing. So he used to, he used to hold my shirt. He used to hold me like this, the wall go white. He used to hold me like, like this and then he'll push me, like go now. Timing on crosses and stuff like that. And all these little things that you do as a kid. I remember, I was 17, 16, 17. I still do that now. And, and, and I mentioned with, uh, with the Palo de Canio one, one of the most professional players I've ever seen. Like, never took a day off, was always in the gym, was always doing extra compared to all the other players, and was always the best player on a pitch on a Saturday. Like, it was unbelievable. And, it, and, and you know what? I remember Paolo, especially with me, he was sort of like, it was always approachable, so I can always go up to him and just chat to him. I was in the youth team dressing room, training was finished, and I was just going, just sitting next to Paolo and just chat to him, and he'd just have a laugh with me, he'd talk, have a joke and that, like, he was crazy. But he always used to sort of like, um, and I remember my first Premier League goal against Ipswich, right? So I don't know, he got an injury, so he was coming off. And, uh, you know, normally that's so he was coming off. So he, he, he took the, arm, the armband off and he gave it to me. But like, I thought he's going to give it to me to give to like a Trevor Sinclair or Carrick and Cole. Yeah. The professionals. I went like that and, and he, put, he put it on me. Like, he put it on me. And I went on and I scored. It was, um, it was like, there's, 
the fact that he done that to a kid, do you know what I mean? Like it was mm-hmm. I never forget stuff like that. Nice touch, nice touch. Hundred percent, man. Yeah, you man. never forget them things, man. No, but that's why that's why, that's why I've always got time for the young the younger players. No, big up yourself, brother, man. I spoke to one of the younger players yesterday, and I said to him that like you got like you got a lot of potential. You got to keep training hard, blah 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 blah. I just said to him, you know what? If you ever want to just chat to me about anything, I said just come and like put me blah blah blah. If sometimes. If you're upset about something, something, don't let the coaches see it. Come and talk to me, blah blah. Because I've been there. I understand what you're going through. Sometimes mm-hmm. when I was younger, and it's when I was when you're young, and there was times where I'd be training with the first team, but then the under seventeens want me. They they need me for one of the games because they're trying to win the under seventeens cup. And I'm thinking, hold on a minute. But I don't want to be playing for under seventeens. I want to be in the first team, sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? Not that arrogance. It's just confidence. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you just you just got to do it. Get on with it. Just get it done. Don't give people the opportunities. Be like, hold on a minute. Who do you think he is? You know what I mean, he ain't done nothing yet. Nah, try and get your head down, do what you got to do, and make sure that you 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 you, you don't waste the day. And that's and, and that's it. So, so that's it, man. Jermaine, so how many yeah. more years do you see yourself playing for? Thirty-seven years young. Do you know what? I thought. I thought. I thought. Do you know what? Even like um, we did like a, a game yesterday, and I come off it. I thought, do you know what? I still feel sharp, man. They're like, I feel <laughs> sharp. And well, how many did you pack in training? Up. Yeah, I always, seven. Up, I always wind the boys up. I'm like, what? I said, lads, I'm 37 and now. I, I'm, 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 I was the best trainer today. I got mad enough today. Like, I'm 37. What's going on? So, like, winding them up and that. But now I still feel, I still feel, I still feel like I'm able to do a lot of the things I was doing, say, three, four years ago. Hmm. Get little niggles here and there, like Achilles and stuff like that. But, 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 and so, like, I mean, I still, I still, I still feel, I still feel, for me, the main thing is, is the sharpness. Do you know what I mean? Because, you know, hmm. sometimes, especially if you come up for injury, and you're not on it, you don't feel sharp, you get your shots off and stuff like that. But for me, when I'm still sharp in and around the box, that's the most important thing because the fitness thing, I mean, at the end of the day, it is what it is, you age. So you're not going to be like as fit as you was before, mm. but you can fitness in games. But I always think that if I'm sharp, I still can get my shots off and I'm still, I'll be still able, I'll, st- I'll st- still manage to get my goals in there. And that's, and that's important and that's, what, and, and that's good for the team, do you know what I mean? So, so yeah, man. 100%, man, 100%. So, um, of course, again, man, uh, Jermaine, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure, man. Thank you very much for taking out the time to, to just have this conversation with us, man. It, yeah, it, man it's it, uh, I know all the listeners and the viewers um, have enjoyed it as well. Okay. Uh, before we sign off, though, um, we just want to uh, let you guys know that Jermaine has um, very, very um, kindly agreed to um, uh, donate... Uh, uh, a signed shirt or uh, a pair of boots, whatever one we're, we're gonna we're gonna go with, uh, to a lucky winner. Now, the, the 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 grounds for this is that this video needs to get a thousand likes on YouTube. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel. It's the Beautiful Game Podcast. Make sure you share it amongst your friends, family members, uh, work colleagues, your group chats, and all the rest of it subscribe, like the video, leave a comment, and we're going to be picking someone at random who is going to get some signed memorabilia from Jermaine Defoe. Yeah, right. so the best comment, the best comment on the video. Come again. Man? I said I've actually got the boots there waiting. So wherever, wherever. <laughs> what boots are they? The boots Nike, New waiting. Balance, Pumas, what are they? I'll show you, Nick. Live, so live on air. Right, yeah, cool. Cool. <laughs> this is, wouldn't this. be the same without Jeez. you. Ooh, nice boots. The new, these are the new X's, Adidas. And what what what's so good about it is, see all my boots. They sent Adidas. They sent me. They said they sent me this with a with a JD nine on it. Nice. You see nice. with the England flag. Yeah, nice. Wow. What's that? I'll normally wear six point seven five. You know. Wow. Okay. But these ones, yeah, these ones are seven. But I normally wear like a six point seven five or a seven. Okay. Small feet, so you can slap the ball. Yeah. <laughs> there, there you have it you heard it from the man himself so make sure you um you you're in you're in with a chance to win like i said we're going to pick someone at random so you've seen it we're not we're not we're not lying to you you saw it live and direct waiting, waiting. there for you um so get you get get in with a chance to win also before we sign off just a reminder as well on twitter it's at podcast underscore tbg on instagram it's at pod underscore tbg um, and you can also listen to our um, uh, episodes on Spotify as well as um, SoundCloud and on Apple Podcasts as well. And if you're listening on, on Apple Podcasts, please make sure you leave a five-star review. Until the next episode, people, over and out. Peace.